I am Trillian Atwood, the Director of Public Programs and Visitor Services here at the JMM. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual presentation today, the last 100 years of Ashkenazim in Mexico, shifting identity definitions with Dr. Adina Sinai. The program continues our series about global Jewish life. Please consider joining us next Sunday, September 19th at 1 p.m. for our final program in this series, Global Jewish Concert. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Sarah Manasseh, who will perform music from the Iraqi Jewish and Bene Israel traditions, and Netta Alkiam and Amit Hai Cohen, who will perform music reflecting their Judeo-Moroccan heritage. For those of you who were able to join us for the virtual screening earlier this summer of In Your Eyes, I See My Country, Netta and Amit will be familiar faces. At the close of the program today, we'll share a link to register for this event. As a reminder, you can also view recordings of past programs in this series on our website using the link that should pop up in chat in one moment. Now, our presentation today is one of the closest to us geographically in this series. However, we're about to hear um, this again is another unique Jewish community with a fascinating history. We're especially excited today to be welcoming Dr. Adina Simei to guide our learning about this community. Dr. Sime was born, born in Mexico City to Eastern European parents and grew up in a Yiddish speaking home. She earned her degree in sociology from UNAM University in Mexico City and received her master's and her PhD in sociology from the London School of Economics and Columbia respectively. She is the author of books, Ashkenazi Jews in Mexico, Ideologies in the Structuring of a Community and Jewish Lobbyism, a Cultural Monograph. Dr. Sameh has also served as the Director of the Educational Program of Yiddish Culture for the YIVO Institute in New York, and has lectured widely at institutions in the United States, Mexico, and Europe. So with that, Dr. Sameh, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate your words. And I think we can start. Um, this overview of the Ashkenazi Jewry in Mexico, these hundred years, should give us an opportunity to concentrate on, I would say, three themes. The first one is that it's an opportunity to understand or to at least have a sense of what is the extraordinary effort creativity and drive needed to create a Jewish community. Because this community is so small, we're talking about today 40 to 45,000 Jews, but in fact only 20 plus thousand Ashkenazim, because there are other types of Jewry as well. And uh, this small group gives us an opportunity to see as if magnified this effort to create a community, a setting which, with shared Jewish values and meanings, something that was created ex nihilo. You have to understand these Jews came to Mexico not knowing its history, not understanding its language, not knowing anything about its flora or fauna, its climate, its food, the traditions, the religion. It couldn't have been a more strange situation in which they had to sort of root themselves and, and create something of meaning for themselves. Second, it will give an opportunity to see what kind of institutions are essential to have a Jewish community, or rather to have a Jewish community that is interested in continuity of its culture. Um, in Mexico, you will hear about uh, organizations that form a network and its commitment to local problems, as well as to Israel, from young to old, from uh, birth to death. Um, and that is important to remember that doesn't happen just because there was a genius person that came and thought it or somebody else able to wield it. No, it was done through conflict, through battles, fascinating exchanges of ideas and ideologies that some political characters took on by themselves and fought them out as they understood them. Third and last, our last theme here, is that once in the last 30, 40 years, this community is well established. 
that it lives as if in an inertia of no change anymore. And it appears to a visitor or to somebody that gets acquainted with it just uh, quickly, uh, that it is the community that has always lived like that, that things that are have always been, uh, have been like that. It's important then to realize that in fact, things became like that, that things were willed like that, through interactions between parties. And that will allow us to open up a set of questions which we, with which we will close our talk today. So let's start. Um, Jews did not arrive to Mexico in the 20th century, even though we are going to be speaking only about the 20th century because that's the current modern community that we have today. Jews arrived to Mexico with the Spanish conquest as Marano or hidden Jews, as converted people, Anusim is the word in Hebrew, and they were persecuted the same way as they were persecuted in, Sp in Spain. They were persecuted by the Inquisition in Mexico, this judicial institution that was established in Spain about a hundred years before it arrived to Mexico, um, using brutal methods to combat what they considered religious heresy. The accused were tortured and burned alive. And that system existed from 1570 to 1820 in Mexico, which tells you that continuity of Jewish life was hardly possible. It was for the most part thwarted. And although there are some theories that there are pockets of people that can trace or, or claim to trace some continuity with that period, that would be a topic for another period and another time. We start with the 1860s when some financiers come from Germany and Alsace came to Mexico to do businesses. They, however, did not build a community. They got intermarried. Some return to their countries. Our story starts really with the 20th century, when Jews from uh, Turkey, uh, Sephardic Jews speaking Ladino, arrived, finding it a little bit easier to adapt to the country because of the language. And um, Arabic Jews, Mizrahim, as it's called in Hebrew, from uh, Syria, from two cities, Aleppo and Damascus. And these three groups, so together, um, two, yeah, three groups together were the beginners that had in 1906 already a synagogue and 1912 a rabbi and felt that they had been invited. The president Porfirio Diaz, a president that was a dictator for 31 years in the country till 1911, had offered an invitation, so to speak, but it has always remained a kind of, it was then and remained until much later, an ambivalent kind of position of the government. Some people were for and some against. They wanted to invite 5,000 settlers uh, to help them settle the vast land that the country had empty, and they had 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 a difficult history with the United States uh, 100 years before, right? So that they were interested in um, protecting their land. However, Jews were considered um, not very assimilable people, urban people more than people that could be settled in the hinterland, so that nothing really came of it. The Baron de Hirsch, the German Jewish banker and benefactor who was heading the Jewish Colonization Association to resettle Jews in Argentina, Brazil, Canada, and so on, tried it also in Mexico with some help of Jewish organizations from the United States, but nothing really happened. Jews arrived to Mexico by themselves alone individually to settle in this country. And the first Ashkenazim that got to Mexico were those that came during the First World War uh, from the United States, European or American Jews that were escaping conscription to the war and settled in Mexico, some of them temporarily, some of them stayed on, not many, but they were the ones together with the others that existed that after the World War um, welcomed Jewry from Russia, from Lithuania, from Poland, from Germany, from Hungary, that came alone to settle in the country. And who came? Mostly men, mostly very young, 
individuals alone that settled in the historical center of the city in what we call today vecindades, inner city constructions that were perhaps before either abandoned or sold once uh, after they were used as uh, mansions. And they were converted as multi-storied um, living quarters, which were cheaper as apartments or rooms, sharing a courtyard. They were used, it's a U, um, shape kind of, uh, of construction with a courtyard that was the space for social events, religious events, uh, child uh, play area, work area, and so on, kitchen sometimes also. And in those apartments, there were ateliers for bakers, for tailors, and for other workshops. Uh, though the majority became peddlers, self-employed, so to speak, selling from the smallest and most insignificant items, which we would look at that way today, shoelaces, scissors, mirrors, or needles even, but they implemented a system that left a great uh, mark in the country, delayed payment, and that helped distribute merchandise and stimulated a growing middle class uh, that was not in existence at the time. Um, by the end of the teens, these Ashkenazim, which were already a few hundred, not many, uh, started to feel that they had discomfort with the other Jews that sort of welcomed them, that they could have forced uh, to organize by themselves and separate into their own subgroup attending to their own culture. The reason of uh, synagogue ritual discomfort was good enough a reason to separate and create a uh, different uh, prayer home space called later on Nidhei Israel, a name that will remain uh, important in this community, uh, paying tribute to, to that origin. And then later on also created a new cemetery um, with the excuse that the prices were too high and they needed to do it on their own. But it was really, really the strongest move to separate and to create a, their own identity. The attempt to do a school from the Talmud Torah, which was a small religious school in the synagogue, a proper secular Yiddish Jewish school called Yiddish Shule in Mexico, Jewish school in Mexico, from 1922 to 24 took its time to settle properly. And this was momentous because by then you could see that the definition of their identity and what was at stake and the desire to sustain and hold on to culture, to their Jewish culture was so important for them. They were writers immediately as they came they wrote, they talked, they had little groups in which they met, they met. Who are we, they asked. What are we doing here? What can we be here or do here? And the possibility to share in those questions and to give joint answers or to negotiate the answers to those questions came because they had one glue element that bonded them. And that was Yiddish and language. Language, and in this case Yiddish, was that worked for them. That was their common denominator. They came from different countries. They didn't have a joint experience uh, or joined other languages. That was the only thing that that bind them together. And with that, they could explore their existence, the, what they shared, what they wanted to communicate, and what they wanted to do with it. Once they established the school, uh, the Bnei Brit from the United States showed up and said, hey, people, we're going to help you. We're going to send money. We are big brother. We can do something for you. But you need to follow our advice. We want you to avail yourselves of the schooling Mexican system and only provide an afternoon school or a complementary afternoon school with Jewish education because we want us that your children and the new generation should adapt as fast as possible and adopt the local culture as its own. That's what they've done in the United States, they said, and that has worked for them. It was also behind it, the reason was that they did not want these Jews to keep on thinking in moving up to the North because they would become a problem for them in the United States. However, the immigrants in Mexico, these Ashkenazi, um, small little group rejected it completely. They said no money, 
and no directions. We are organizing a full day school for our children from kindergarten to primary to onwards. And in fact, it covers still uh, upper high school, uh, eventually, not yet then. And we want to sustain and to reproduce our culture as the tool with which we are educating these youth. And so in 1927, as only a few years of experimenting and dealing and discussing with all of this, they got from the American forwards, the Yiddish newspaper, the print lettering. And so a deluge of printing started happening in, the, in Mexico, in the country. In 1928, the first book in Yiddish, Drei Wegen, Three Ways, published by and, pre, and collabor in collaboration of three writers, Glikowski, Glantz, and Berliner, three people that were different, different poets, different thinkers, that answer different to the same questions, how to settle in this community. If anybody reads Yiddish from this audience, you can go to uh, the Argentinian YIVO materials, and then you can see there a sample of, the, of their work, which is interesting and very moving, by the way. Uh, there were pamphlets, there were journals, there were newsletters. In 1929, a newspaper, Der Weg, which had a long life in the country. In 1935, Die Stimme, and so on and on and on. In 1938, the first other important organization that was settled close to the Second World War was the Central Committee or Central Committee, an organization that had to negotiate or wanted to negotiate with the local government immigration of Jews. For the most part, they were unsuccessful because the same ambivalence on bringing Jews to the country that I talked about in the turn of the century continued during the Second World War. And as you know, it continued in most of the countries of Latin America. Uh, the government was really not open to Jews. And that, I want to qualify, was not the way they treated every single refugee. For instance, they were Spanish refugees that were running from the civil war in Spain, uh, anti-fascist against Franco. Uh, 25,000 Jews arrived that way uh, to um, Mexico. They didn't stay forever, all of them, but some did, and all, most of them contributed in very nice ways to the cultural life of the country. That didn't happen with Jews. Jews were not given that opportunity. Um, I can make a parenthesis just to tell you, my grandmother came as a survivor individually to uh, Mexico. She was 42 years old and lived close to 50 years in Mexico and never got papers. She was always, she always remained as an apatrida, a stateless uh, individual in the country. In any event, how did Jews, though, in that, in that very tragic period of history and conflicting period, think of themselves and of the world affairs as they were happening? They used the sophistication of the ideas and ideologies that they brought from Europe. We had socialists, we had Bundists, we have Zionists of all types, left Zionists, Shomer Atzair, Poalei po Zion right Zionists from Heirut and centrist Zionists, which by the way, became the central group, the dominant group in Mexico. We had a few anarchists, we had communists and all had very deep and elaborated ways of understanding what one should do at that moment. The Bundis, for instance, argued that Jewish culture of diaspora, the Yiddish culture, a thousand year old culture and language, which was mature and rich and a phenomenal tool to approach anything in their life should be sustained and supported because each minority had the, uh, the right to live in freedom with cultural autonomy. This, as we know, is still a problem today for many societies and many minorities. But at the time, it was momentous and it was a clear wording of it. This whole ideology didn't sustain its force, but then it was very, very important, despite the fact that it still is. Uh, Zionists were small divided groups into uh, different positions, and the only thing they shared together at the time was that they all supported one concrete place, Eretz Israel. And in the pre-World War, Second World War, that was an option that everybody had to feel comfortable with, more or less comfortable with. However, 
after the Second World War, that idea became essential for Jews. The economic support that they always managed in due proportion from such a small community, uh, once the state became an, a reality and was in existence, uh, it showed that Europe had foreclosed all, all dreams of coexistence, all the responsibilities needed for civic life and security for Jews. And therefore that Zionism had become not only important as an ideology, but Israel itself had become not only the site of economic support for one community among others, but the emotional heart of Jewry and its connectedness and a legitimate and authentic form of national quest. That idea, that form and strength of that philosophy and ideology only has gathered and garnered much more echo and strength as, year go, as years went by after the war. What happened to the anarchists and communists? Very few, very sophisticated, came very prepared with a complete different lens to understand the world in a macro way. In a, in a, the world had to change in many ways, according to them, to, to fit the, all humans, if you want, all societies, and of course, also Jews. However, their alliance to the Soviet Union was often blind to the fact that there was anti-Semitism and rejection of Jews in that country. And certainly in the 50s, when uh, there was this terrible treatment of Jews in the open almost, that destroyed and killed physically, uh, as well as, in, as uh, uh, intellectually, the, the ideologues of the community, Jewry, the elite of Jewry, writers, actors, poets, and so on and so forth. And they could not reject the Soviet Union or dissociate themselves from that kind of policy. That's when the community marginalized them, allowed them, of course, to think their own way as they wanted, but they did not have any more a function within the, within the community structure. So schools were bubbling, the synagogues were, um, were reproducing themselves. We had many organizations. I want to uh, talk about one personality that arrives in 1944 that is kind of paradigmatic to what is going on in this community. And I'm speaking Abraham, about Abraham Golong, a phenomenal towering figure born in Lithuania, educated in yeshivot in Kiev, but became a secular Jew that lived, uh, that worked and produced as a pedagogue, as a writer, as a philosopher, a polemicist, an educator, worked on issues of agriculture, biology, psychology, and a very, very wide range uh, of topics. Arrives in Mexico in 1944, but with tremendous experience in Vilna from 1921 to 31, he was the head of the teacher seminary, trying to uh, implement teachers that would reproduce these ideologies, his thinking. In Israel, in Eretz Israel in 1932, he was the head of Mikve Israel School and almost got a very high position in education in the Yishuv, but the disagreements on the use of Eastern European Jewish culture there made it that he left. He went for Canada and from Canada, he was invited to Mexico to arrive and join the school that was already um, there for 20 years, but give it a push, give it a solidity that only he as such an international figure could do. And he arrives and talks about his integrale Yiddishkeit, which is integrated Jewishness, it's suggesting that the, every Jew needs to be in house and out a total persona, that Jewishness has to be organic to that person in its language, languages, that those are the key tool to contain, to deal with, to understand, to tackle Jewish culture that has a chain for such a long time. He created a teacher seminary. He, uh, this is a period when other Jewish schools are also being formed, Yavne, the religious Jewish modern Orthodox school, um, and the Tarbut, 
a Hebrew a Hebrew school that started with bilingual education as well in Yiddish Hebrew. Um, but he gets criticized. He gets attacked in he's not a political figure. He doesn't negotiate at all anything for what he stands. Bundist attacking, culturalist attacking, Zionist attacking. What does it mean that he comes to Mexico suddenly to teach everybody how to be a Jew there? They don't like it. And so he needs to leave the school, takes the seminary, creates a new school, the Naye Yiddish Schule, the new Yiddish school, Yud Lamet Peretz, in honor of the writer Peretz. And it feels like it. It doesn't matter that he left one school and creates another one, because everything's booming, because everybody's looking for options and refinement of their ideologies and identity definitions. However, that will not remain like that forever, and we'll come back to the point. At the same time that he is moving to the new school, a new option appears on the horizon, and that is a community center created by the Ashkenazim called the Centro Deportivo Israelita, CDI, um, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal kind of community center. I have not seen anything like it in the United States by far. Um, it tackles all sports almost on Olympic level. It has a ballroom, it has a library, it has a theater and a staff right now of about 400 or so. Prior to the pandemic, there were 600 people working there. And what is new though, besides the fantastic facilities that eventually became, is that it was considered for all sub-communities. No ideological tensions or definitions were there. It was easier to go there and find yourself identified as a Jew for sure, doing sports if you like it or not, just enjoying this, the premises, being a secular person, and that was enough. None of what was going on in the school system and with other cultural organizations was reflected there. But that had another push in another direction. Golomb in the 60s finds himself now working with a younger generation that actually doesn't see everything he sees in the same way. The parents in the board of the school want a different balance between Yiddish and Hebrew, more Israeli teachers, um, perhaps more English rather than Yiddish. And so Golom leaves the country, he goes for the United States, abandons the school in a way, or may, is made to abandon the school, whichever way you want to look at it. And in other words, what is happening was the foretelling of what would happen later on, which wasn't understood at the time at all. It felt like a, a, a director is in, a director is out, what's the big deal? But in other words, what happened and what was written already on the wall, if you want, was that if he could not survive in that community, what he stood for was also going to be left bereft and abandoned. The call for this great style of organizations, four schools, many cultural groups, many synagogues, um, the, the other organizations that were the youth groups and so on, came to suggest that we needed to centralize, that the community was dispersing too much and it needed a body that would control its political life. And so the a Kehila was formed, a Kehila which was called Nitre Israel, honoring that original history of this community. And it was echoing the old Jewish structural system of self governing that started in the Middle Ages to be used in communities in Eastern Europe. And it encompasses encompassing uh, all Orthodox synagogues, despite the fact that the community on the Ashkenazi side was not strongly Orthodox, but only used the Orthodox synagogues for its rights and united all other uh, organizations, uh, schools and uh, old age home and everything else available then. So since the 60s, the Kehila became the central political authority. 
Uh, some people may know that in the United States, in New York, especially there was an experiment with the Kehila in the for the Lower East High Jewelry from 1908 to 1922. The reasons for that were a little bit different, were to control that group of uh, poorer Jews that had arrived versus the German Jews that were here already established. In any event, it was not a successful um, uh, fully um, established organization, very different from Mexico. The Kehila in Mexico since 1960 till today is strong and stronger. It's the central uh, body of Ashkenazi Jewry, the central authority. And despite the fact that the central committee, the organization for negotiating with the government from 1938 or the sports center um, remained outside of its control, they were aligned and cooperate with them uh, on everything they have to do. And they cover the old age home, the self-help group, the health groups, the um, discapacity groups, all Zionist youth groups, and so on and so forth. The head of, the, of this organization was uh, Shimshon Feldman, a talented uh, politician, negotiator, and practical man that had the means to um, be independent and devote himself to this work. And he established a very different goal with his authority for this organization, a goal that started as authority and turned into more authoritarian. He claimed that the Kehila would have to turn and to become an organization that would um, uh, support and uh, welcome harmony, cooperation, a decrease of conflict as it had been in this community, unanimity and efficiency, efficiency in economic and hum of the human resources, not to spoil things and not to waste things, supporting Israel uh, and the state of Israel, as well as um, the local community and its needs. As you can imagine, this motto meant that all political discourse now had to function and root itself in the Kehila. There was a suggestion and thus there was a recommendation, if you want, that all political dissent or ideas or activities should be only there and everywhere else it should be minimized and eventually abandoned. What they recommended is that people live their lives, take care of their jobs, their family, their leisure time, and the Kehila will take care of all other political decisions of the community. So what we started to face from the 70s, 80s and onward is a kind of inertia, a very structured institutional community with a central government that did away, by the way, to anything they decided was superfluous. Groups that were weak or a leadership that wasn't as um, useful for them or as vibrant or anything else was deemed unnecessary and therefore uh, done away with it. The most notorious thing that became orphaned was the Yiddish culture because there was nobody really defending it, although there was a, um, a Bundist in the Kehila that lived its life in cultural control of his arena, but worked it as if it was an independent part for himself and not really echoing what was going on in the whole community. The Hebrew, the Yiddish, I'm sorry, institutions, the teacher seminary that closed, the fact that Gollum left, were left actually without institutional support. And you know what else? No one was demanding otherwise. The young parents were satisfied with the abandonment of this uh, older, philosophy and ideology and uh, identity that existed in the community. And they were all rooting for a simplified way, a, a more unidimensional format uh, that allowed for their identity to be shrunk and simplified into more Israel and Hebrew, as well as some traditions. It seems that there were no effective transmission of these cultural values and no followers. It is a bit shocking to think that such a community that devoted so much attention, years and effort to defi def defining this kind of identity actually lost it 
one to three. I'll give only one example uh, the, from, between the poets that I have mentioned. Yaakov Glanz, one of the writers that was so early on writing uh, and questioning, should he root here? Can he forget his own roots with which he came? Can he merge roots of the new place with the older place? And the answer was, of course, yes. He, of course, is a character that is important to understand, has a daughter, whose daughter is a very well distinguished writer in Mexico, Margot Glanz, a specialist in literature, a uh, distinguished member of the Academy of Spanish Language. However, a lady and a woman that doesn't speak neither Yiddish nor Hebrew, and therefore doesn't have the tools, not only not to understand her own father's work, but not the tools to get attached or delve into uh, Jewish culture as it was understood necessarily inherited. When I say that it was left bereft, the Yiddish part, it doesn't mean that nobody anymore spoke Yiddish or nobody dealt with it. There were people that continued in an inertia of their own, like Vele Zabludovsky, a teacher that was working in the Naye Yiddish Schule that continued till the school closed in 2011, uh, trying her best, uh, preparing some teachers or uh, training, uh, uh, doing some courses, whatever she could do. But the truth is that this had lost interest and support communally already for a long time. The Kehila became an organization that is passed from son, from father to son, as it was passed after Feldman's father passed away, the son took over it. He invited a few, a few cronies to join him, opening up a bit the door. This group retained control and really retains control till today. Some of their children are active and very, very few others. It's a very male dominant organization with very few exceptions of a couple of women that have worked for years there aligned to this kind of style and, and uh, authoritarianism, if you want. It's uh, closed in. It's, uh, it's not transparent. They take decisions, sometimes phenomenal, like when they dealt with the pandemia, uh, the pandemic right now with other subgroups, they did a fantastic job. But many other um, less momentous moments are um, dealt with uh, with their own logic when you are not tested or told or understand why somebody is in or out or changed or whatever it is they do. And so this is what is there. And we can ask the question, is Ashkenazi Jewry in Mexico today Ashkenazi Jewry? What are they? Who are they? I think the answer will be that the synagogues, the Ashkenazi synagogues remain there as the strongest differentiating style in the rights uh, of traditions uh, between the sub-communities, the Arabic Jews and the Sephardic Jews. There is some gastronomy, knishes, some houses make those, uh, some caterers sell them. Um, a little bit of vocabulary, like in English, you have vocabulary from Yiddish that they swarmed in and is used sometimes uh, consciously or unconsciously by the population. There it is as well, much less so than in English, of course, since it is a, um, a smaller community. Some songs, some music, a little bit of that is there. But all in all, I think one is safe to say that Ashkenazi jewelry today is just jewelry. And that may be to the happy conclusion of uh, many people. The community is mixed. Uh, all subgroups uh, are interwoven. Um, the three Jewish Ashkenazi uh, schools have children from all communities because they only teach Hebrew and there is no problem with that. The community as a whole, including the other subgroups, has 13 uh, day schools, um, a Montessori school, yeshivot, strict ones, and yeshivot light, and other secular schools, the Tarbut schools, and so on. And the Kehila remains an efficient more or less central organization. And you are here to judge how do we tackle and understand what is there? Do we use a bird's eye view 
or a graph to say, look, they started building from nothing, ex nihilo, as I said, a first synagogue and another one and another one till they had close to 40 and organizations and youth organizations and cultural groups and uh, theater groups and music groups and dancing groups and Maccabiya groups and so on and so forth. Something that provides a description of a society that is very satisfactorily uh, wide, uh, highly uh, complex in many ways, uh, very um, comprehensive which eliminates from that view the interactions, the conflicts, whatever it was that actually made it happen. And so we remain with a feel good reflection from the mirror on the wall, if you allow me that expression, uh, as that is what has been done in Mexico. And that is exactly what the leadership wants to feel and pro projects. And many of the analysts that work with the community directly are what they uh, suggest existed. Or, and I will suggest something else, if we continue being conscious of what history gives us. The picture that things are not done by themselves, that meaning, values, and traditions actually happen um, when people discuss them and fight for them and try to root them. Is that a way one needs to analyze this community? And if that is the case, then does one analyze what is there, what rooted there, this uh, abandonment of the bilingual culture, the Ashkenazi bilingual culture, meaning Yiddish and Hebrew, making it a monolingual one, only Hebrew. Is it important what was eliminated, what was forgotten? And who claims responsibility for the ways of living in this community and for the cultural inheritance to the new generations? Those are questions that I leave open. I have my own answers, of course. I'm sure you have yours. And um, it is certainly a worthwhile place to acquaint yourself with and even visit. Hopefully, you will be able to do that. There is much to see. And it's fascinating to try to understand and delve into the life of this 100-year community in Mexico City. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adina, for such a fascinating presentation. Um, I'm Laura Grant. I'm the program coordinator here at the Jewish Museum of Maryland, and I'm going to transition us into Q&A for this afternoon's program. So for those of us, um, for those of you joining us in Zoom, please submit your questions using the Q&A button that you should see at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are watching on Facebook, please submit your questions in the comment field, and a member of our tech team will pass them along to be answered here. And we'll do our best to answer all the questions focusing on those most closely related to the topics that were presented today. So I'm going to start with the first question, which um, takes us a little bit back in your presentation. There's a question about um, the Jewish immigrants who came to Mexico after World War I. Um, was part of the reasoning behind that related to um, immigration in the US at that time being severely restricted? Well, they, no, they, the reason they came is because they were escaping to be uh, conscripted to uh, the military in the United States. They had come from Europe, they had come from pogroms, they were uh, tired, they were just uh, trying to avoid that kind of a responsibility. And that's when they joined Mexico. When they wanted to return to the United States, those that wanted to return found themselves with the border closed, of course. The American border was very closed. And some had to come in illegally if they managed. Um, and some couldn't come in. So that was a problem. And that was also part of the thinking of the Bnei Brith and other Jewish organizations um, who were actually um, trying to find a way of keeping this new Jewry settled there. Because to bring them in, given that the Lower East Side had already the, those, uh, the first decade or two of problems, uh, bringing again a group of people that needed help and attention would have been extremely complicated. And besides, there were no visas available. This had to be done possibly if it could be done illegally. Nobody was interested in undertaking that, of course. 
So one has to separate the arrival reason and then the return. Great, thank you. Um, another question, um, are there any databases or genealogical sources with which to trace family from Poland that came to Mexico in the interwar period? Yes, there is a there is a documentation center from the Kehila actually as well. Um, you can Google that and find it. I think the person interested, and uh, there is a director. They speak English. I think you can get in touch with them and uh, slowly try to see what information they can offer you as far as. Uh, what they have there, you know, it's a not a very old organization that was put together, and I'm not sure how directly rich the genealogy department is, but I'm sure somebody, given that it's a small community, names mm -hmm. can be sometimes traced and found. So it's worthwhile the hunting effort. Thank you. Um, there's another question here about um, whether the um, Ashkenazi community is concentrated in Mexico City or whether there's other centers throughout the rest of Mexico, either perhaps historically or today. Yeah, it's a good question because yes, there are other communities. There are the two larger ones, which is in Monterrey, the north of the, of the country, uh, have a, a, a good community and in Guadalajara more to the east um, both have shrunk a lot because of the insecurity and lifestyle and crime and problems uh, some of the those jews have come to mexico city and so their uh, schools and synagogues and have been you know are weaker nowadays and to begin with there were the small communities i would say 90 percent of jewry is, is in mexico city and these were very small communities the there were also in other small towns uh, early on from those peddlers that traveled to work in other places. So they, you know, settled in different places. Today, I think one can consider and add a new one in Cancun, uh, the resort. Uh, there are uh, quite a few Jews. And I hear that even in Merida, Yucatan, close to Cancun, they are trying to establish a synagogue, a uh, couple of families. I mean, but it's tiny, tiny effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, there's a question here about the um, what has been the attitude of the Catholic Church towards the uh, Jewish community since the end of the acquisition, Inquisition, sorry. Well, that's a very, very, yes, large, very large question. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church has been, uh, was like all Catholic Church, not very favorable to Jewish uh, welcoming in general. Um, in the 20th century and with the changes of the church as an institution in the world, uh, that has been lowered. In 1929, there was uh, some attacks of anti-Semitism, one and only time public attacks. Um, a glance, for instance, that poet was in the street and he got beaten up and things like that. It happened one time, they were uh, quite a few, a few uh, feelings of anti-Semitism sort of that exploded in the open. Um, but other than that, it's quite uh, controlled, I would say. Are there anti semites I'm sure. There is an anti-Israel feeling from the left, uh, which is uh, expressed sometimes in university, uh, also strong. But in general, the government has not supported any of it. Um, they, uh, they try to keep it under wraps. And yes, people do experience. We have a, a historian that is very well known, uh, Enrique Krause, for instance, uh, writes and publishes in English in the United States often. Uh, also, uh, just recently, there was some uh, difference of opinion with the government and some people told him you can leave, you don't like it, you know, that sort of thing. He's born and bred from Mexico and it's absurd and it's a very important historian. It happens, but it's not uh, sanctioned by the government and it's not massive. Thank you. Someone has asked if you can comment about the impact of Rabbi Rafilin. Uh, um, is that something you could speak to? Directly not. I mean, uh, I'm not uh, so aware and I haven't researched enough the impact. I mean, these different rabbis have had different uh, influences and they are um, rabbis Actually, the community as a whole has become more visible thanks to the Sephardic and Arabic Jews who are much more comfortable showing um, themselves as Jews publicly. Ashkenazim never did that. 
much and Ashkenazim uh, were less religious to begin with. Uh, so um, this is a different change in the last 25 years, I would say. You have a lot of kosher restaurants, a lot of places sell you kosher food, and you know it's very much in the open, and you see them walking with the attire, much more religious attire uh, than regular kippah, suga, a simple, uh, you know, a, a cup uh, or a more modern clothing. So there is a sense that jewelry is more visible that way. Thank you. And this question um, kind of relates to your last answer about the relationship between the Ashkenazi and other Jewish communities in Mexico today, specifically. Well, um, yeah, that is a very interesting and complicated question, actually, and complicated problem to know how to react to. Because, of course, one wants all Jewry to be a brotherhood of people. You know, it's uh, uh, one wants a um, everything um, united and everybody um, coordinating. You have Israel, which works with all different types of Jews, uh, but it's not easy and it's not perfect and it's not fantastic because at the same time, all efforts of the 20th century, the Second World War experience, Israel as a state, speak to the fact that we wanted or somebody wanted, the Jews that lived in those same times, wanted to uh, support, to protect and to maintain Jewish culture. And Jewish culture as a totality has not been maintained, not in Israel and not in the, as my you know, explanation gave you. Things that were rooted, the understanding of this bilingual need, because it's such an old tool. The Yiddish is a thousand year old you know, item that is the key to enter into so much material. If it is abundant, what does that mean? What does it mean for the cultural life of the group? So that is on the one hand. Of course, uh, the demography of Jewry changed after the Second World War. Before the war, uh, the vast majority was Ashkenazi, and so the Yiddish was so important and dominant. This has changed after the war and after the changes like that. And the question is how how do we sustain this diversity of sections of culture within our midst? I don't think we've had a very good answer, not in Israel and certainly not in Mexico, I can tell you that. Um, but it's, it's a question that I believe very, very strongly that needs to be asked and needs to be attempted to un be answered uh, by all. We don't gain much more by losing it. I think we gain by sustaining it. Um, and that is something that needs to be addressed, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. Thank you. my personal opinion. Anyway. <laughs> I wonder if I can ask, we heard in your bio that you were um, born in Mexico City into this community. If you could speak a little bit about your experiences growing up, um, you know, what languages did you speak? What was schooling like? And um, your experiences living in um, Mexico City and immigrating to the United States? Okay, so I was born into a family. My father came as a young boy from Poland, from Rubieshov, a city, a town, I should say, close to Lublin, that area, with his parents. He was a little boy of three or four. And there were three children, and two more were born in Mexico. By chance, they ended up in, in, uh, in Mexico because they were a family that wanted to come to the United States, but couldn't anymore, and they remained in Mexico. So they lived in Mexico. They very early on were the product of this educational system, the children were sent to those schools and so on and so forth. My mom, on the other hand, is uh, a little girl survivor from Kovno, Lithuania. Um, and she came to Mexico with my grandmother because they had, my grandmother had a sister that had come way before and lived in Mexico and paid for them to come individually, as I mentioned. So um, my parents' common language was Yiddish, as it is, because my mother came as a teenager, and our home was a Yiddish-speaking home. But our family had also Hebrew-speaking people because there was a member of the educational system, Avner Halifas, 
who married an aunt and um, they uh, raised their children with Hebrew. So our family was basically a bilingual kind of uh, family in a way. Uh, we are three children, I'm the oldest of three, and we were sent uh, to the Naye Yiddish Schule, this Golom school, uh, all the three of us, till high school. And after high school, we did university in Mexico. Both my parents worked as professors in Mexico. My father was a chemical, um, metallurgical chemistry specialist and then later an architect and sculptor and he was a professor full-time in the university uh, in architecture. My mother studied also sociology and uh, worked and produced and wrote and has written books uh, on sociology on theory uh, in the National University and she sort of caught up because she came as a teenager with no schooling and no papers whatsoever and no language nothing so she had to catch up and manage to arrive and satisfy that need for herself. As the children in our home, it was very important to do, to reach, to achieve education, as you can imagine. So we were sent to um, university, each one in a different field. Uh, my sister is a chemistry specialist and uh, music, and my brother is an architect as well. And uh, I became a sociologist. And now I married um, somebody that I met from London, who I have an aunt in London, so by chance. So, and we moved to the United States, and that's how I came uh, to study here and uh, do my graduate work here. And my family was born, my personal family, my unit family was born here. I have two daughters, and so, so yeah. But I go back to Mexico all the time. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I visit my family and I think of Mexico and I leave Mexico because mm -hmm. after all, that's what gave me my basic thinking as, as a Jewish person. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to wrap us up uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Samet, for just such an interesting presentation and for sharing your wealth of knowledge about um, this community. Um, so thank you. And thank you as well to Trillian for introducing today's program and for providing tech support and for Joe Gale um, for providing captioning for uh, today's program. And thank you all in the audience for joining us. Before you go, we're going to drop a few links into chat. So first, we'll have a link where you can register for the upcoming virtual program that was mentioned um, at the beginning. So join us next Sunday, um, September 19th at 1 p.m. for a musical concert celebrating Jewish heritage around the globe. So that'll be the first link where you can register for that virtual program. If you've missed any of our past programs in this series exploring global Jewish life, you can view the recordings via the next link in chat. Next up, there will be a link to Dr. Samet's book, as well as a link to um, a book that she recommended called The Jews in Modern Mexico. For those of you who are interested in exploring um, this topic further, I encourage you to view those two links. And finally, as a reminder, as you leave the webinar this afternoon, you'll be directed to a survey about your experience. If you could please just take a couple moments to fill this anonymous survey out. It really does help us as we plan for future programs. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again, Dr. Samet, thank and you. thank you everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon. Have a great rest of your afternoon.